I'm the art well of the now if you're you, that sociopath and as we've learned from the impeachment hearings we can't rely on partisan Republicans to put country before party so we have to do it ourselves if we're going to save this democracy and that's exactly what we're trying to do here today for the next hour we're going to be interviewing some very interesting people you might recognize and we're going to discuss the issues and also we're going to have an art auction of my art and we're going to give 50 percent of the proceeds to liberal super PACs to help replace those partisans with actual public servants Hello, my name is Ryder Cooley, and I am an art educator. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you some artwork by the artist Michael D'Antuano. Michael's first painting is titled, What Makes America Great? It is 46 by 70 inches, oil on canvas. In this painting, Michael shows a diverse group of people working together to raise the flag. They are toiling on a mountaintop, heaving heavy ropes to lift up a symbol of justice and equality. The landscape in this painting is idyllic, framed by mountains and blue sky. The flag is leaning like the half-mast of a ship. Perhaps it has fallen, or perhaps it is being raised up again after the long repose in order to set sail on a new voyage of hope. Overall, this painting represents the determination of the people united and their hope to make a better world for everyone. Hi, <clears throat> it's Michael D'Antuano and I want to thank you for watching. Uh, this is going to be the very first episode of a four-part episode of Democracy's Last Stand. You're going to hear from uh, best-selling author Malcolm Nance in just a couple of minutes. But first, we're going to talk with uh, my friend and the father of street art, Ron English. Hi, Ron. Howdy, Mike. Good Heard you're going to put a, a bunch of masterpieces on the auction block tonight. Yeah, how many did you buy? And it's a good thing because, um, I mean, half of the money, half of the proceeds of other paintings are going to go to the Democratic cause to, to beat Trump and his enablers. Yeah, but, you know, the most important thing is that some people are going to own some world-class masterpieces and be able to brag about that for the next five generations, right? That's, that's yeah. what it's really all about. Yeah, well, that, that too. Democracy, be able... Democracy's nice, too. <laughs> I've kind of enjoyed it. <laughs> that's just a side, a side benefit, absolutely. Well, um, now, the painting that we just saw was uh, the painting that Ryder talked about. Was that, um, was that what makes America great? Yes, it was. Okay. Now I know that. So, um, Ron, what make, I think it's diversity that makes America great. And uh, I'd sure like to send that message to that uh, re retarded Tony Soprano in the White House. <laughs> what do you think makes America great? Um, I think Trump makes America great. It's like, I think that we've overcome a lot of stuff with him. I think people used to have a hard time with drag queens. Now we've got a drag queen president. He wears makeup. He wears more makeup than Kiss. And you know, that would have freaked people out 10 years ago, but now they're kind of like used to the idea. So I think he's opened up a lot. That's, that's not what you were going for, right? No, Absolutely. honestly, I think, I think that um, people come here to this country for a reason. And a lot of times they came from very oppressive type of situations. So they actually appreciate what this country has been. And yeah, no, it's not been the greatest country and it's, it's fucked up a lot of stuff. But at the same time, this is where you come to make magic. This is where you come to make your fortune. This is where you come to have great ideas and we can help you make those great ideas. And there's not a lot of countries that can say that. No, this is the great melting pot. We, nobody else has called that, right? Right. All right. But all, all, the, all the great art came, they came because people from all over the world came here and made it happen. It was, you're right, it's a melt, the melting pot made the great art. Do, do you believe, I believe that this, uh, this election really is democracy's last stand. Do you feel the same? Yeah, I think that um, either we're going to stay America and the America we've been dreaming of and live the American dream, or we're going to go down a very, very dark path. And yes, some people are going to do really great. You know, my, my wife is from Iran. And when, when the, this shit happened to them, 
some people did really great, but I don't think that they're doing that great. It's like, yeah, we, we get to cut the head off of artists for, you know, drawing the parliament. Aren't we great? It's like, that's not my idea of greatness. And I know that's a lot of people's idea of greatness. And I know they like what's happening, but I don't. I don't think that's what ever made us great. What I don't think and too many people would be happy in the end if Trump gets uh, reelected somehow. Well, even or, the people or... that adore him because he's a wonderful celebrity and, you know, they, they would like to be as rich as him or as rich as they think he is. They're going to suffer greatly. Once he gets, like, absolute power, their lives are just as screwed as ours are. They're not going to do any better than us. Hell, we'll probably do better than they, they do. It's, it's insane. I think they do not know what they're doing. Or as, you know, as Jesus once said, you know, they know not what they do. Forgive them, Lord, you know. They know yeah, not what they do. That's what Peter Yarrow uh, was telling me on the on the next episode after this about the same thing. Don't don't hate the the person. Hate the hate the thing they're doing. Right. And yeah. and you know, but it's like every day the Trumpies sell off another thing. It's like, well, I guess we don't respect the military anymore because our guy doesn't respect the military. But they give away everything a day at a time. And at some point, there's what, what do you have left? Who are you? What do you represent? What are you for? You know. You get, he's taken it all away from you, like a piece at a time, and you defend it over and over again. Who are that, you? You know. That's true. That's true. Now, um, <clears throat> I think uh, we're going to go back. We're going to go maybe to Malcolm now. Is that correct? So let's hear a little bit from Malcolm, and then we're coming back to Ron and I. As promised, I'm here with my very good friend. An MSNPC contributor and a best-selling author of numerous books on uh, detailing the relationship between Putin and, and Trump. The person I think should be considered the uh, Paul Revere of our time, my friend Malcolm Nance. So Malcolm, you've been a big contributor of mine for a while. And um, could you tell me why you think that the art is uh, important at this point in time? Well, first off, your art's been important for some time. It's not really a question of is it important right, right now. Uh, the things that, that Mike paints about are so varied, but what they are is they're really a chronicle of everything that we're doing. Um, you know, everything that we're seeing in this period of really chaos. Uh, a lot of your work goes back really far. I mean, some of the things that you were, you were showing from, uh, you know, oil spills to, um, you know, the inequality of children in school, those are almost timeless now. But it's only recently in the Trump administration era that, you know, you've managed to capture in very Norman Rockwell-like fashion. And, and that, that essence of how one how the average American is being victimized by this. And the other is how horrible these people really are. And that's why your, your paintings evoke really strong feelings in myself uh, and many other of my peers in news media who see your work, they, they love it. You know, you're not, you're not like that crazy guy McNaughton, right? The Republican who, you know, shows lies like Obama burning the constitution. You know, I mean, Donald Trump is beholden to powers that are outside of this country and they affect this country and much of your art shows that. How can um, people use my art to uh, help the cause? Well, I mean, they're, they're, first off, it's just a question of having seen it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this, this great painting of diversity, which is one of my favorites. I mean, my family, virtually everybody in my family has a copy of that poster because it really shows the struggle that the average American is, is involved with now uh, in trying to broaden and, and, and make the United States what Lincoln called a more perfect union. Um, that's being torn down, that's being destroyed right now. And this image, uh, amongst others, is one that shows that we aren't monolithic. This isn't a one-color society. We are made up of the motto, e pluribus unum, from M many, one. And for those of you who think that it's just some quaint saying, it is the literal words under the Statue of Columbia at the top of the United States Capitol, from many, one. And this painting, which shows diversity, this painting shows from many comes one unified nation. And that is what's under attack right now, the 144-year concept of the American experiment.
Well, I have to agree. I have to agree with Malcolm, and and who wouldn't? But uh, in in strength, there's numbers. United we stand, and divided we fall. Wouldn't you say? Yeah, I, I think I think Malcolm should be our president. I would be able to sleep at night. <laughs> but no, of course, it's like it's like if you have a band, what makes the band great? Well, you know, maybe I, I'm a great lyricist, and he's a great singer, and he's a great bass player. But if if you peel apart any part of the band, they can't make it. It's like when. Mick Jagger tried to be the Rolling Stones without the Rolling, the rest of the guys. It didn't work. When Keith Richards thought, I'm going to do a solo career and I can be the Rolling Stones without Mick. I know Mick's hard to deal with, but if you really want to be the Rolling Stones, you got to have him in the band. And, and I think that's what we're kind of talking about. We, we're trying to, you know, cut the country in half, have a civil war, you know, take out half of the country, but you, you will never be great again. It's impossible. We need all of us to be great. Absolutely. Malcolm also was talking about um, all the money on the right, how that, that one artist, the, the conservative Ying to my liberal Yang, has, um, <clears throat> he's, he's selling his paintings for lots of money because that's where the money is in, in the, are, in the are rich. You sure and that's just that's for a lot an of example. Money? Are you sure he's selling his paintings? Because a lot of people <laughs> lie about stuff like that. Oh, I. Would they lie? I, I find that so hard to believe. But what's not a lie is all the money is at the top. It's not, it, the, the money is not equally distributed even close. I mean, the gap, the wealth gap is getting worse and worse uh, regularly, wouldn't, wouldn't you say? Yeah, but you know, sometimes I wonder if, if that is not like a, a, a weirdly natural human instinct and the whole concept of America is, is really uh, a weird dreamlike aberration because like if you go to another country or if you go to Thailand or somewhere, it seems like everybody's really poor, but then they'll have this great, uh, uh, like not church, but you know what I mean, great monastery or something. And it's built with millions of tiny little beautiful little pieces. So each one of those pieces represents a person. So like that collectively, they, 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 let's give it all to one person. You know, like in a weird way, like if I, if I had to explain who Trump is, he's an avatar. It's like, I work at a factory in the Midwest. I make $40,000 a year. You can get nowhere on that kind of money. You know, and I, I can't do anything. I can't beat the system, but you know what? I can help him be the richest guy in the world. And when he drives by in a limo, I could point and say, that's my billionaire right there. I may, I help make him a billionaire. Now I'll never be a billionaire. I won't even be a millionaire, but you know, I made him and I'm part of that. And I think it's a weird human instinct, you know, to, to, to launch one guy into space while the rest of us sit here at home. Well, I wish he were a much more honest billionaire. That's another problem. I mean, the, the guy lies more than, uh, I don't know, more than the Pope prays. So- But, but a, li a lie is a, 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 a absolutely useless. I can't, I can't lie to you. It's not gonna work. You know, you, you have to have a recipient for the lie. Somebody has to be ready to believe. You know, so they well, have to be in a weird, weird suspension of disbelief. So he is nothing without followers that are willing to believe anything he says. Oh, that's true. So that's in a weird true. way, the guilt receptor. lies with them. Yeah. You well, know, speaking of lying, like when he was trying to sell the healthcare system, you know, in a way, he's like, okay, I got everybody to throw away their healthcare system. Now, you Republicans, you have a shiny new healthcare system behind the hospital because we're about to blow up the hospital. They're, they've agreed we're getting rid of the hospital. Now, you do have a shiny golden hospital behind it, right? And they're like, wow, we didn't think you were that good because we got nothing. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't believe you sold them that. You're good, <laughs> you know. Good. If you have a bridge like in Brooklyn, maybe you could sell them. But, but I mean, yeah. So it's 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 it, you know equally there's equal responsibility on the people that that are so gullible and they buy everything that he says. You know, they're just as guilty. As, in a way, they're more because he's kind of a little bit of a sociopath and a narcissist, and he's never been anything but what he is, and he never will be anything but what he is. But those people bought into it. Yeah. You know, in a way, they're they're more guilty than he is. I could I could see that. Hey, have you ever heard of Roy Zimmerman? No. Well, you're heard, about to. Zimmerman. Well, who's Zimmerman? Help me out. No, not, not Zimmerman who shot Trayvon Martin. That's it. Because I heard he sold a painting for like $100,000, right? Well, that could be a lie also. That's a whole other story that we will get into at some point. But well, Roy you know, Zimmerman. You know, is Char Charles Manson had little sycophants that, that still worship him to this day. So if some people like think Zimmerman's a fucking hero, then, you know, well, that's people are psycho. I don't know. No, but what I'm about to introduce is the good Zimmerman, oh, not okay. the bad Zimmerman. We got oh. a good, and he does fantastic music videos. His last music video, so um, just had how many, like over millions of views. Okay, mm -hmm. and I know that you do great music videos also, 
and we will show one of those soon. But first, we're going to start with Roy, and uh, it's the the liar sleeps tonight. We. Self-obsessed wing, the liar tweets tonight. He says, hush you doctors, hush reporters, hush you science nerds. Look, my ratings are through the roof when I just say happy words. It's just the flu. It's a hoax like all the rest. A left wing coup. We've got lots of PPE. The cupboard's bare. It's Obama's fault, you see. The bug stops there. In the country, the quiet country, no nurses sleep tonight. But in the White House, the full of shite house, the liar tweets tonight. <laughs> So that was Roy Zimmerman and the Lion tweets tonight, and it was 50 million views on YouTube. Now that's some good numbers. So Ron, here's the, here's your your little quiz. You ready? This is part quiz show. Also, um, you will if you could name five lies that Donald Trump has said, uh, you win a you win an autographed poster. Okay, um, climate change is a hoax. I didn't collude with Russia. Bing. I never cheated on any of my wives. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You have all day. Um, what was what was today's? Um, oh, I never dissed the troops. I've only praised them. I never dissed John McCain. I only praised him. Um, never mind, like all those tweets that are archived. This is too many. We don't have time. We don't. But you did. Congratulations. You won a. You won an autographed poster. Oh, thanks. Yeah, uh, not one of mine. One of yours. But oh yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. it's okay. <laughs> well, anyway, all right. So that that was a, a great video about about his uh, tweeting and all like that. What do you think? What do you think our odds are? And and try to be a little optimistic. You think if we pull together like that painting behind me. If we all pulled together, we could beat this guy. We could bring back our democracy. Well, I would say probably two thirds, or I would say, yeah, at least two thirds of America are not gonna vote for Trump or, or they want Biden. Um, I think the weird problem that we're going into is, is um, we're, go we're, we're about to have a race and I got a really, I got a brand new pair of Nikes and my opponent ha has a, a Cadillac and so, it's weird that we're going into this thinking he's already going to cheat. He's already going to steal so much of it before, you know, so like we have to win in like 50 landslides just to break even. That's yes. kind of weird, you know? It, it, it's very weird. But Although, you know, like Putin gets 90% of the vote. That's what I, was I guarantee say. you, if he wins this time, 
the next election, he will get 90% of the vote. Yeah, yeah. And it's not so weird in Russia. It's weird here. It's never happened here. And yeah, but everything, you know, happened, you know, yeah, I think it hasn't happened here, but uh, here we go. We can't, we won't be able to say that in a couple of years. Well, hopefully, hopefully uh, it's just going to go smooth. We're going to have Biden and Kamala and it's going to work out fine. Well, you know what? I'm, I am, I am ready to be bored. I am ready to just, oh yeah, things are kind of boring. It's like, oh yeah, they, they finally got a vaccine for that stupid virus and everything's just back to normal. And it's like, wow. So I, yeah, I just want to paint flowers and, and landscapes and pretty, pretty scenes and pretty. No, then I have to talk to all my old friends about, you know, painting and music and who's cutting a new good album now. And oh, there's this great show on TV and like, you know, here's a great place to vacation. And oh my God, I've eaten at this restaurant. It's amazing. You know, it's like we're gonna have to talk about normal stuff again. I don't know if I'm ready yet. You know, <laughs> yeah. no, I'm very ready. I'm very <laughs> ready to see human beings in person. No, I mean, it's like we've been drinking Tang for the last four years, and now we have to drink real orange juice again. I don't know if I'm ready, man. It tastes too natural. Okay. How about you, Mike? Are you ready? Are you I ready? am. I am very, very ready, and that's why we're doing. I'm. I'm giving fifty percent of the proceeds of these paintings just because I want to live in a country. That uh, where you can make those kind of paintings. Where I can make those paintings. <laughs> these could be these could be the last anti-Trump paintings you'll ever see uh, if we don't get our head if we don't get our heads together and work together. Yeah. So well, are we going to hear think, from I Malcolm think, now? I think we we figured out who the cowards are in this country, and now we got to figure out who the heroes are. Yes, the morally the morally bankrupt and yeah. and. The rest of us will be just plain bankrupt if this continues. What's well, funny, so many people in my life I used to look up to, and then like one by one, you realize, well, they don't respect the troops. They, they don't respect the minimum wage. Just like one thing after the other, and you realize, why did I ever look up to you? It's like you're a, you're, you're a moral bankruptcy, man. You and know? that was hidden. That's not your fault. We didn't know about it until... But, but before, I thought they were super decent people that I kind of admired, and now it's like they've they're, they're not that at all. There's, there's, they, they ticked off all the boxes. They, they don't stand for anything, you know? Well, they wanted to make America great again. And I mean, we grew up with all the yeah, old- they wanted, to buy, they wanted to buy cheap red hats from China and then bitch at me, who, 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 by the way, my clothes are made in the United States of America and shipped to China. And they want to take a dump on me. Meanwhile, it's like, you know, because my company is, isn't as big as Trump's company. You know, I'm too little, you know? It's like, I'm doing the right thing, dude. You know, you're, you're, you're buying hats from some guy making them in China, and then you're bitching about, like, they're, they're shipping all the jobs to China. It's like, what the fuck, <laughs> you know? Yep, you, absolutely. Yeah. All right, let's see, uh, let's see what Malcolm has to say about all this. Okay. Huh. Malcolm, you, of course, know the reason we're here today, to raise funds uh, to replace partisans with uh, public servants. Yeah, that's exactly why we're here. And, you know, you just can't do that. This is a modern world. You just don't go up, you know, throw a dollar into a, into a bucket these days. We have to raise real money. And that's why I think it's just wonderful that you have this art that's really evocative uh, and it's being offered to the public in such a way that they can actually own a huge piece of this second American revolution, right? You know, on the conservative side of the ledger, they have really their own artist, uh, a guy by the name of McNaughton, who's done some extremely provocative art and has raised millions of dollars by selling this. There was one piece of art that's, that was in the former speaker of the, the House's office showing President Barack Obama burning the Constitution, all right? First off, it was based entirely on a lie. And that's the difference between your art and his art. Your art is based on the truth of what we all see with our own eyes, right? No one's saying Donald Trump is setting fire to the Capitol or anything like that. He's, he's, he's in his own world. And your best works of art are the ones that show the African-American experience. And look, as somebody from that community, I'm, I was moved to tears the first time I saw it. And so were many of the people who've seen your, your work. It has inherent value. And that value, uh, which I know at one point you had an auction that was well into the mid six figures before eBay canceled the auction. Um, the, the value of it is the fact that it captures a true American essence. 
If Norman Rockwell were alive today, that painting would have been his painting. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, as far as eBay is concerned, what happened with that, I was auctioning off this piece, a tale of two hoodies, um, in response to George Zimmerman trying to profit from his notoriety for, for killing Trayvon Martin. I was so incensed, I auctioned this piece on eBay. I had a seven day auction and on the second day, I was about to pass what he got, which was $100,000. And Zimmerman's auction ended with $100,000 he was rewarded for his first time painting. But I was passing him. I was already up to 50,000 on, on the second day and it was going up and we were definitely going to pass his number, which would, the point was to prove that Americans are not racist, that they support the victim more than the killer. And uh, I mean, that's why I did it. And what happened was I got a call, just as we're about to, to break the record there, we got a call from eBay, and what did they tell us? We took your painting off. And I said, well, why is that? And they said, well, because it goes against our policy of not glamorizing hate groups. <laughs> well, you just let a, um, a killer of a black kid make $100,000 off of his uh, reputation. That's, ri that's glamorizing it. I'm giving half of the money to the Trayvon Martin Foundation. So that argument they couldn't argue with. So then they told me, well, you know what? That's besides the point. They're, we don't allow anything with KKK symbols on eBay. So what could I do? But I did, it got some press and I got some, uh, some letters and somebody wrote to me and says, just go on eBay and look up how many KKK items are for sale. And it was about 1,500. And some of them were glamorizing the hate group. Look, Vincent van Gogh, didn't sell a lot of his artwork as a contemporary. I'm not saying you gotta die and cut your ear off, okay. you know, but I can tell you the first moment I saw A Tale of Two Hoodies in its large format oil splendor, and I was floored. I was just absolutely flabbergasted. And between that one, the talk, and the one you did of President Obama, my first thought of this art was, this should all be in the African American History Museum. This art really captures that. And this is why, again, you know, I always evoke Norman Rockwell, who lives near me. You know, I, I mean, I live near Norman Rockwell's museum. And I love that art because it literally captures the true meaning of Americana, as does th these paintings. And for eBay to have stopped that, but to allow George Zimmerman, a man who murdered uh, a, a child, to, to get away with it is an anathema. But, uh, you know, this art is invaluable. I own uh, a, a piece, uh, a private piece, uh, that someday I hope I'll be able to donate to a future President Barack Obama presidential library. But uh, it truly captures the essence of, of African-American experience. Well, the African-American experience is not obviously something I know of firsthand. I've learned about it through my paintings, actually. I could only try to empathize. Uh, so I don't really can't understand what they're going through, but I do know that obviously racism is definitely wrong. Based on the color of your skin, it would be just as ridiculous to uh, judge somebody by the color of their eyes or, God forbid, their height. Um, so. I just find that a totally useless reason to make people's lives worse. Um, and it's definitely gotten worse over the last four years. Would you say, Ron, that he's given license to racists? I had no idea there were that many racists still left out there, you know? Okay, like I've never experienced, you know, being a black person and, and having that against me. But I, I, you know, in the 70s, I had long hair. And you would you would go we you know we would all leave for lunch from our, our job and it would the sign would say no long hair right and then we would all have to go to another restaurant and I I was hurt and humiliated and to this day I'm still mad about that now then one day like all the rednecks grew their hair long and and whatever that was it was it was a, a very a minor blip in the history of things but just just that small experience of that for that very short period of time I'm still mad about that. I'm still hurt about that. I still hate those sons of bitches. You know what I mean? So yeah, I can't imagine. But but you know, empathy is is being able to at least try to imagine what it's like to be somebody else. And and also you know also a weird thing with me is like, well like I don't know my old roommate Dred Scott. It's like his, his 
they, it's like he gets into the upper echelons of the, the art world, but at the same time, they, they also, they, they kind of control him in a weird way. It's hard to explain, but it's just, I, I, would, I think it's just a very, very difficult thing to navigate. You know what I mean? Well, empathy is, uh, well, the Republicans are basically Democrats without the empathy. And uh, that's true when it comes to, uh, to racism. It's, it's true when it comes to class and, and money. And it, it's true when it comes to soldiers. Uh, it's the whole GOP. But Trump in particular can't have any empathy for those who gave their lives in battle, as you know. But you know, that, that he may just be um, somebody from the upper class who maybe they all think that you know, maybe they all think that's, you know, for the poor people to go die in the wars and the suckers and stuff. You know, maybe he just allowed mouth enough to say it outside those closed rooms. You know, I don't know what happens when the doors close. You know what I mean? I'm, I don't get that far into it. So maybe they're all like that. I don't know. But yeah, he definitely put it out there. Yeah, I, have to, I, I would think so. Now, someone asked me um, just recently here today, um, are there any new pieces I'm working on? Uh, I'm not, I haven't worked on any new pieces since, uh, for a while. I've been concentrating on, on this show, trying to get, you know, people excited with the pieces I've already done and, and the conversations we're having to vote. Um, and now that's an interesting question because, uh, whatever happens during the election, either we won't have to paint about all the injustices because there'll be fewer of them or we won't be allowed to. Well, you know, I was just telling somebody the other day, it's like, you know how, how we know when the world is good again? It's when, when Michael D'Antoine was painting a rose. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, things yeah. are starting to look up. In my opinion, things are usually going good when people are freaking out because Britney Spears showed her tit at the Super Bowl or some insane non sequitur about nothing. You know what I mean? That, that's, nice. that's, that's, that's the kind of stuff we should be talking about, you know? Not why people are strutting up and down the streets with assault weapons and shooting people, and the president saying they're good people. You know, we we, we shouldn't be in this place, man. Well, oh, it sounds like Ryder is going to introduce another painting of mine, and uh, we'll talk about that a little bit, probably you and I. Okay. And then we'll um, we'll go to one of your music videos. Oh, cool! Thanks, my band, man. Yay. Michael's next painting is titled Down and Outsourced. It is 38 by 60 inches framed. Here, Michael has created a painting that is both harrowing and inspirational. The painting juxtaposes the generosity of a homeless veteran with the selfishness, greed, and indifference of passers-by. In this painting, an unemployed businessman is consoled by a homeless vet. The businessman has probably walked by the vet many times without noticing or helping him, but now they are united by their shared destitution. Down and Out Source depicts the harsh reality of unemployment and the lack of care for U.S. veterans. Okay, so there you go. Um, down and outsource. Now there's another uh, painting that actually is about lack of empathy. It's um, the only empathy for that guy who got uh, obviously laid off that you see there with the cup, the mid-level executive, comes from the um, comes from the Good Samaritan, the homeless vet, who is a guy I actually found on the on the uh, street begging in front of a Walmart parking lot, and uh, that was his actual sign, a veteran. So. In, in that painting, we, um, I, I talk, it's about, it's about lack of empathy and, and care, uh, both for our veterans and, and the class warfare, the rich people just walking right by him. Probably, in my imagination, the guy who got laid off also um, walked by him many times on his way to a tax-free lunch and never noticed him. And now, with the unemployment high as it is, now he too is, is invisible. Thoughts? From me? I always like to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I, 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 I think that the, that the, the worst move that a, a society can make is um, put somebody in charge of things that has no empathy or no understanding. Even with Obama, I mean, 
he had lived our lives before. He had been us before. You know, he had to deal with the healthcare system before. You know, he had to deal with real life. It's it's you're you're making a big mistake to get to somebody. Donald Trump has never been caught in traffic. He's never been caught in traffic. He get he, there's a heliport on top of his building. He, get, he gets a helicopter to Teterboro Airport, gets on a private jet, and goes wherever he needs to go. Nothing's a hassle for him. He never he can be a smart aleck. He can pick on people. His whole life he's had 15 bodyguards. I mean, could you imagine like in your high school years? It's like you know, you, you, yeah, you can just smart off to anybody, but you never have to be in a fight. Somebody's always going to clean up your mess. And, and that was fine when his dad was cleaning up his mess. That was fine. I mean, that's his dad's money. He keeps screwing it up. They got plenty of money. They'll be fine. But now we're cleaning up his mess. And, isn't, and that I, that, you know? isn't it ironic that, that the man who is so entitled all his life is literally taking away our entitlements that we paid into all these years, our Social Security? You know, he's bankrupting that as we speak. Well, he thinks that's money's for his rich friends. Um, and, but, but a lot of people can't get their mind around that because he's not, he's taking away the means of, get, of collecting the money for the Social Security. They, they can't quite understand that means there will be no Social Security. It's like, you know, you have to be able to collect the funds to be able to pay out the people that are going to get their Social Security. So That's, that's true. But, but oh, also, you know I, mean, I, just bless him. I don't know how the fuck he does it, but that guy is so fucking smart that he will take away everybody's Social Security and they'll be proud to give their Social Security to Donald J. Trump. I'll, I'll live on the streets for that man. You know, there are people like that. He he has like a cult-like leader yes. kind of quality about him, which is insane. But they will defend anything he does. It's either fake news or, you know what? We're going to hate the troops now. You know, you, you're right. There are a bunch of suckers. I, you know, yeah, you get, yeah, the definition of uh, being a loser is getting killed or getting captured. Yeah, I'm with that. So the, he, he backs them into a corner every week, and they have to rebuild in that corner. And either they have to say it's fake news or um, yeah, you know what? We're gonna we're gonna throw away that that ambition, or or, or that moral, you know, for this man. You know, it's insane. That's, it's the weirdest that's thing. Another reason. Kind of like we could all laugh at Jim Jones when he took everybody and, and had them all drink the Kool Aid. It's like the yeah, that, that's, What's that, the that difference? sucks for them, but it's like you know. But you know, the, the trouble is, we have to drink the Kool Aid too, man. You know, hey, if all his followers don't drink the Kool Aid, that's great. But it's like you know, we're all drinking out of the same well. Yeah, but what you're forgetting is that the the Kool Aid manufacturers are going to make a lot of money out off of it oh i i know i know right I know. but it'll all be solved when we uh get biden and kamala harris in as a matter of fact there uh, i just noticed that uh, behind me is uh well that looks that's that's my latest that is my latest painting uh yes we can mm -hmm. and uh we're also selling that uh on my site as yard signs and posters mm -hmm. that uh, people can use and Get the word out. Well, you know, you remember uh, Edward Monk's uh, The Scream? That one I know. Right. So basically a painting that as, is as famous as that painting in, in the history of art is going on sale. And you can get it for probably a hundredth of what it's worth. I mean, imagine if they were going to sell Edward Monk's The Scream for $50,000. And you know what it's worth. And yeah. you know its place in history. Yeah, that's what's happening right now. And it's like, you know, I, I, I know that we're trying to save democracy, but somebody's going to make out like a bandit here, Mike. Oh, absolute profiteering. Say it's no, not no, true. But I mean, it's like at least smart enough to wake up and think, you know, like the, um, a Republican bought my Abraham Obama. And I'm like, well, you're a big Republican. Why'd you buy Abraham Obama? And he goes, because that is a piece of history. So right now people are getting the chance to get a piece of history. If it's a good investment, if it's a good so, hey, if, hey, if you want to regret it later and say, man, you know what, I, I should have bought that. What, what the, what the hell was I thinking? <laughs> you know, it only goes like, up. You weren't thinking. That's what you were doing. Well, you know, you know who knew? Who knew? Right? Yeah. Like the Rosie the Riveter is is also another iconic um, piece yeah. of history, I would say. And it, and it, ironically, it was about a woman. It's just, it really represents the the strength of women in the '40s to fight fascism. And now, now we've got Kamala is doing pretty much the same thing, right? Right, right. No, I think that's. No. I think that's. No, they, they're they're a great team, and it, it's going to be really nice after they they get. I will be sleeping at night, believe me. <laughs> things will get taken care of. Things will get dealt with. Everything won't be politicized. We'll 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 get a a vaccine that'll be a real vaccine, not like a fake vaccine that's going to kill half of us to take it. I mean, it'll be nice to go back to normal and and and, and build on that. You know, I, I'm yeah. excited for that. You know, I, I had a life before Trump destroyed it, and I, I think I can get it back.
Yeah, I remember that. That was fun. We got, yeah, it was great. We got to see each other. Now, besides being just a, the godfather of street art, and uh, I mean, one of the biggest artists of our generation, uh, Ron is also a musical genius. And he's got a whole band and a whole world he created called uh, Delusionville. And uh, the main characters are the rabbits. And, and the rabbits, I, I just the rabbits are with three Bs, Mike. Remember? With three Bs, rabbits. So the rabbits, so yeah. I'm hoping that somehow we could magically show a video of, from the rabbits. Okay, well, that was quite a video. I'm not sure which one it was, but I liked it. Yeah, Fame Finds the Village Idiot. Man. No, that Still one? Oh, you heard it? So oh, yeah. yeah, I like that one. Yeah, but, uh, I tell you, yeah, I don't know. My, the name of my band is The Rabbits, yeah. and it's The Rabbits is spelled with three Bs, R-A-B-B-B-B-I-T-S. That was easy for you to say. You've been doing this for years. Yeah, well, you know, it's weird during the... Um, uh, this pandemic and the lockdown, we, we've still been able to um, make over 100 new songs. So it's kind of interesting because everybody's working in different spaces and it's a little more complicated, but uh, we're rolling on, man. And can you just, in 25 words or less, explain um, the concept of Delusionville? Because it's what we're living in in the real world. So All right, I created, I created Delusionville, like kind of when this whole nightmare started. Um, so I wanted to create an alternative universe where all the politics are kind of weirdly upside down. So it's kind of an Aesop's fables meets um, an animal farm kind of thing. So they're all animals. So basically on the surface world, all these animals existed and they had their social status. And then when they all go down this rabbit hole, everything gets reversed and they are the opposite of what they were on the surface world. And basically this world was created um, for me to be able to talk about politics without you know, getting shot. You know, Because it seemed like at some point, you know, maybe it was the Trumpism thing that, you, you weren't, everybody just went ballistic and nobody wanted to hear facts or news or anything. They already made their mind about everything that's ever going to happen in the history of the world and in the future of the world. And you couldn't talk about anything because everybody was insulted or thought you were talking about their guy. So I created this world as a space to talk about religion and politics and social status and the social system in a weird world where they have their own religion, they have their own politics and they have their own social status and it's separate from ours. So we can actually talk about these big issues without me, you know, without you thinking I'm messing with your religion or your politics. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. It's a safe, it's a safe place, yeah. Do you think your art, your music, my art, you think, how much of a difference you think we can make with the art? What is the power of art? Well, the power of art, um, 
is communication. It's it's always been there. The, the cavemen, you know, told their stories on, or cave women, we don't know, but they told their stories on cave walls. Um, Hitler, you know, maybe it didn't turn out well with him, but you know what? He rallied all those people to do all those evil things using art. You know, so art is a very, very powerful weapon. Um, I'm glad that we have you on our side instead of the other side, because, you, you know, it is a very powerful tool. It helps people understand things. We are far more visual than I think people realize, you know, because usually when you try to express an idea, like if I make a painting, then they want me to write an essay about the painting. It's like, just look at the painting. The painting's saying way more than the essay could ever say, because we are a visual people and it's a visual medium and it can get an idea across succinctly, quickly. And, uh, you know, I think it's a very powerful thing. And um, if anybody's telling you it's not, it's they probably want you to, throw your paintbrushes in the waste basket. Oh, there are those who, who definitely want, there are people who want to break my knuckles. Um, yeah, but you, yeah, I also got to remember a lot of these people are, are, are 15 years old, they're drunk, they're sitting in their parents' basement and they're messing with a famous artist and they think it's funny and I really got his goat that time. <laughs> yeah, they're are, so clever too. You know, yeah. No, no, they're not, they're not. If you met them in person, you would not be impressed with them. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I also, been I impressed, like, yes. okay, like, here's the thing, like even just with fame, um, like, if you're going to make a big statement, you're going to part the waters. You're going to part the waters. And, the, and the, you know, the bigger statement you make or the bigger impression you make, the, the, the farther the waters part. So that means you got a giant wave on each side and the wave gets bigger and bigger. So, like, if I really want to make a statement that some people are going to be completely on my side and, and, you know, devoted to me and the other people are just going to be more and more angry, the bigger I get, you know, it balances out. So that's part of it. You know, if you're going to be out there, and you're going to do stuff. Yeah, you're going to get death threats. and You're going to get, you know, more on 15 year olds in there basement to think they figured it all out because they just became political five seconds ago or or you know whatever some angry old guy that, that has a bunch of dead cats in his basement or something that just you know thinks he knows everything and, you know that guy know. That's but, my yeah, but those guys but but also remember they're, they're on their computer so they they don't have a lot going on to begin with they're, so they, they have plenty of time to mess with michael d'antoine <laughs> you know what I, mean? I would I'm not worry about that, that man but yeah. also i feel like you know if, if the right people hate you you know you're doing the right thing that's a, it's better than being ignored, right? Yeah, yeah. That, no, that, that with art, the worst thing that you can do to an artist is just ignore them. Shh! Don't tell them that. No, like when um, you know, Mary Boom was promoting uh, Julian's novel, and all the the critics go, oh, "This is a horror show of an artist," and blah 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 blah. And then she just brought all the collectors into a room, held up the paper that said, "This guy's a horror show of an artist." And she goes, "You know what? The critics have not hated an artist this much since Pablo." Picasso. And how'd that turn out for him, man? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so yeah, I was not worried about the criticism. Just as long as it's the people you love aren't criticizing. That's that's what freaks me out. And sometimes I'll I'll back off something when a lot of people I actually do admire go, Ron, that's actually not the correct statistics. And and you do notice that when I put up something and if, even if it's not exactly a lie, but it, it's kind of misrepresenting the facts, that boy, my 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 friends get all over me. You know what I mean? They will not let anything slide. You know, Trumpies will just any any piece of like fake info they'll just put out there, and they don't care where it came from as long as it makes their point. You know what I mean? But you know, liberals are weird; they will not let you lie. <laughs> you know what I mean? But uh, I, I respect them for that. They they keep me honest. You know? That's true. Why do you think they're not more um, conservative artists? The comedians and the artists you know, they, are, they have, are basically uh, they, liberal. They, yeah. Well, they have uh, they have Ted Nugent, and they have Kid Rock. They, they, I don't know. It's, 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 it's against the nature of being creativity, creative to want to, to want this kind of lockdown culture. You know, Republicans just want to shut everything down, keep the money in the hands of the people that already have it. And, and they don't want a lot of criticism and they don't want art. You know, they don't like art. Have you ever met a Republican that liked art? I haven't. You know what I mean? Well, except for the guy that bought the Obama painting. But uh, I think he was buying it for financial reasons. <laughs> but uh, no, I'm just saying it's just like they, they're not that into culture. They're not. They're not that open minded. Just just the. The act of being an artist is the act of being open-minded. And so that's not going to attract conservatives. They're not open-minded. Better open-minded than empty-headed, right? I don't know. Yeah. You could use that. You could steal it. And speaking of, I think we're going to hear from Malcolm again. Yay. Always good to do. So I call this collection Democracy's Last Stands because I truly believe that this really is democracy's last stand, this, this current election. What are your thoughts, Malcolm? 
You know, you're absolutely right. I've written three books about this, uh, and the most noteworthy was a book called The Plot to Destroy Democracy, which was not just so much Trump's being a puppet about all of this. It was really a foreign power's plan to, plan to end American democracy as it stood for 244 years. I said it before, we are not a perfect union. Right? It's always been two steps forward, one step back. But we have moved in a march towards progress. But we might be in the last few months of what was the greatest democracy in this world. And there's only one chance now to take it back. If we lose this chance because somebody didn't raise $10, or because somebody wasn't interested enough, or because somebody thought they were a single issue voter and that this wasn't good enough for them, there will be no coming back from this. Our next painting is titled Lock Him Up. This painting is 56 by 44 inches framed. The painting suggests the wishes of many citizens who are frustrated by the injustice of a criminal leader and the willful negligence of partisan politicians who could protect them. Though the face of the politician is not revealed, the artist offers details of a reimagined flag pinned to the jacket and the diminutive hands that can easily slip through the constraints of justice. Lock them up. Ah, isn't that what millions of people are wishing for this, this election or after it? Uh, that, you know, Trump with his hand, hands in the handcuffs. I mean, maybe that is the future. I mean, if he loses, where do you see he's going to be? I don't think that they're going to lock him up. I, I think that he'll probably pay heavy fines for a lot of stuff his companies have done. Um, but no, I, I don't. I don't see an ex-president going to prison in this country. Oh, I I hope that's not true. I think it should be like um, I mean, like crimes against humanity. He should be held responsible for, as an example, and his enablers. It should be like the Nazi hunters after World War II for the damage that he's done. Because you know, it's always been hyperbole to compare someone to Hitler. And I, I mean, I believe that that's not true in this case. I don't think it's hyperbole at all. I think, I think Hitler might compare favorably, I mean, in the amount of lives ruined and the lives lost. I'm not really sure what, uh, what the numbers are, but I think uh, Trump's racking them up pretty good right now. Well, it's similar in that, um, you know, he's, he's surrounded himself by sycophants who, you know, are going to do whatever he says. He gets rid of all the legitimate people in government that actually serve a function and makes everything about himself. And yeah, he's, it's the same playbook. It's the same playbook. So yeah, people are not worried for no reason. And, and, uh, and also, um, you know, Hitler was taking meth and he was completely insane, but it was, he was too powerful to take out. And I think we're about to do that same mistake with uh, Trump, you know, so we're going to have a guy that's kind of, Kind of at this point, insane and and self possessed, and he's going to be very vengeful um, against a lot of us. Yeah, Hitler was also a very unsuccessful artist, isn't that true? Um, yeah, his art was kind of banal. Um, it was competent, but there was no, no originality whatsoever in it. But I, you know, he did understand art, and um, he he did understand how to use art, and he certainly used art, you know, later. And and and, and you know, another weird similarity is. I don't know if you know on Trump's last trip that he took Air Force One and packed it with art. Did, did you actually know that? I did not. Yeah, he's already looting art. He's already stashing art. He knows the value of art. At least, you know, maybe not the, the propaganda value as much as uh, Taylor did, but, but the, you know, the financial value. Right now, art is like super, super hot because it's, it's weirdly a stable commodity only for the upper, upper classes. So it, when things get volatile, it, it, it tends to stay the same. You know, the blue chip art stays the same. So yeah, Hitler looted art, and 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 our president is also doing the same thing. Well, you know what? Maybe he's watching now. And um, like, Liz, Donald, if you're yeah. listening, if but, you but, buy but, you these, know, pieces, people buy art for different reasons. Um, you know, some artists get I'm making frustrated my because, pitch, Ron. I'm well, because a lot of people uh, buy art because it does have historical value and it also has monetary value. You know. And, and basically, how do you know what's going to be really worth something? And, and, and a lot of times, is, is it, you know, very much of its time? Is it very famous in its time? Is it known by a lot of people? You know, so like uh, American Gothic, 
to make like basically you're Grant Wood, you, you have American Gothic, everybody knows this painting, and now it's actually being made available to go into a private collection. So yeah, somebody's gonna figure that out that that with the equation that it's not that hard of an equation. This painting's gonna be worth I, I would I, I bet before we're both dead that it'll probably crack a, a fifty million. But I think in your children's lifetime that they'll probably see it crack two hundred million. Wow. I see. Because everything is about how famous it was, how a kind of iconic it was, and it's a physical object that exists that expressed something that was very important to express at that moment in time, and it was very much a part of, of that moment in time. And so it, it, it's, it's not just paint on a canvas, it's, it is a part of history. So I think uh, we're going to hear one more time from Malcolm. Well, this has really been a truly great show. And Malcolm, I can't tell you how much I appreciate your participation. Any closing thoughts? Yeah, I mean, uh, this is not a joke where we are today. We are literally at democracy's last stand. Uh, listen, this isn't just about going out and buying art. I buy art. I own some of your art. Um, and it's really about what the people who buy this art, will do with it, whether it stays in their house, or as I intend to do at some point, donate it to a museum so that this can get a broader audience. But we can't defend democracy if we're keeping both our mouths closed, our eyes closed, and our wallets closed. This is it. This is truly democracy's last stand. So I really appreciate you inviting me here. I love everything that you're doing. Good luck. Michael's final painting for this evening is titled Democracy's Last Stand. This painting is 48 by 36 inches oil on canvas. In this painting, Michael uses the Statue of Liberty, one of the most iconic symbols of freedom throughout the world, to summons us to vote and remind us of what is at stake in the upcoming election. Michael has rendered the Statue of Liberty as strong, almost masculine, ready to fight and defend the freedoms that she stands for. She resists with her sword and fends off the threat of fascism with her shield. The palette is pastel and muted, suggesting a calm before the storm, or perhaps an ironic contrast to the imminent threats that she must endure. Okay, so democracy's last stand, I just quickly to talk a little bit about that painting is that, um, <clears throat> well, it, it, uh, the, uh, Liberty, she stands for Liberty, it's a woman and she looks a little angry because like I say, this is democracy's last stand, this election and she's ready to defend herself and her weapons, well, our weapons is the vote and that's, and that's why we have the shield that has, has vote D and the sword, just in case they try to stop us from voting. How important is this election? In 25 words or less, Ron. Well, how important is this election? I don't know. If you like America, um, this is your chance to keep it, save it. Um, so, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I know it sounds hyperbolic, but it's probably the most important election of our lifetimes, possibly yeah. in the history of this country. We're basically deciding whether we want to be totalitarian or we want to stick with democracy. You know? And that's our choice. And, yeah. that's our, and that's our evening for this episode. This is the first of four. Uh, thank you so much, Ron, for being part of this. It's such a big part. Um, yeah, thanks for showing also, my, my, my uh, video. That was very nice. Oh, I, I, I always enjoy your video. I play your songs in my car all the time. And soon I'll get a, I'll get a record player or something. But um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, next week, speaking of music, we're going to have Peter Yarrow of Peter, Paul, and Mary. And he's going to sing Blowing in the Wind, like he did in the 1963 March on Washington. You know, I have a dream. So uh, let's come back and let's all meet again next Sunday at this time. Um, in the meantime, the auction will go on and, and also the prints. And we'll also be having this will be on the site even after this live event. And next week we'll do another live event. And that's about it. Let's, uh, let's all do what we can, and I'll see you next week. 
Enough inhumanity, enough corruption, enough insanity, and enough obstruction, enough police shooting, and enough obeying Putin, enough climate change denying, enough of our kids dying, enough of the clan, and enough of that man. This election is our democracy's last stand. Okay, as I started to say, I want to thank Hel Club Helsinki for uh, producing this. And um, once again, see you all next week.